Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Margaret Martinosi is an assistant director of the, at the National Science Foundation. While at NSF, Dr. Martinosi is on leave from Princeton University, where she's the U. Trumbull Adams Professor of Computer Science. Dr. Martinosi's research interests are in computer architecture and hardware software interface uh, issues in both classical and quantum computing systems. Uh, it's my pleasure to, um, uh, um, uh, to have Professor Martinosi. Thanks, Bob, and thanks, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Everything's Great. good. <laughs> wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to be here, uh, as Rebecca was mentioning, it, uh, I'm really thrilled to have been invited and it took a little while to nail down a date. And I'm also thrilled that the, the virtual setting means that the snowstorm today didn't affect us too much. Um, I'm currently on leave from Princeton, uh, working for the National Science Foundation. Um, but this talk will be with my Princeton hat on. And in fact, uh, the room that I'm in is not the National Science Foundation by any means. It's a spare bedroom in Montgomery Township, New Jersey. So hi to Steve, who evidently grew up here small world just north of Princeton. Um, it's also great to have some uh, old friends and former postdocs and so forth out there in Zoom land. Um, anyone who knows me knows that uh, I'm a morning person. And so by this time of night, I'm not usually too lively or even upright. So uh, I would welcome questions throughout because I think it'll be more interesting for all of us and um, livelier. So with that, uh, let's get rolling. Uh, this talk is about seismic shifts. And if you see this photo here, you know that's not New Jersey, right? Um, that's actually the water pocket fold region of Utah. I like this picture for this talk because it is a picture of a case where there were um, sedimentary layers that were laid down horizontally over many, many years. Uh, but then at some point, they got tilted asunder, right? They got shifted. And uh, I think what we're going through in the computing field right now is a similar set of seismic shifts. The end of Moore's law, the technology trends that are stemming out of the end of Moore's law are causing us to have changes, not just in how we design hardware, but also how we design software and how we think about systems overall. And so this talk will take you through sort of a whirlwind tour of different um, thoughts on those fronts. So um, one thing that's been widely reported is that we are nearing the end of decades of Moore's law scaling. And so Gordon Moore in the 1960s articulated uh, a vision uh, in which the number of transistors that would cost effectively fit on a chip uh, would double on some time period. Uh, one to two years. He adjusted his Moore's law actually after a few years. And it's worked out to be a doubling about every 18 months. It's been a good ride, 1964 to the present. Um, but what this graph shows are some ways in which the end uh, is near. So this graph shows 1970 to 2020. Um, and this is uh, from, uh, from 1970 to 2015. This is all real data from industry chips that showed different trends related to Moore's law. So Moore's original um, articulation of the law was about transistor counts that would fit on chip. And so that's these top orange triangles that you see. This y-axis uh, is a log plot. And so since it's a linear trend on a log plot, that's the exponential doubling that we've come to know and love. That's great. Um, that doubling of transistors led for many years to a sort of a proportional concomitant doubling in a single thread performance, like the run a single thread on a, on a year 2000 processor, and it would give you performance that was roughly proportional to the transistor count. But you can see that it's started to tail off because clock frequency started to tail off. And clock frequency started to tail off and level off uh, because we can no longer uh, build chips that cost effectively double the number of transistors because of power constraints. And so you can see that power leveled off, that caused frequency to level off. And what did we do in response to that? We started building multi-cores instead. And so that's where this trend line that you see in the number of quote unquote logical cores starts to bump upwards. 
So as Moore's Law and its partner, Denard Scaling, that has to do with power efficiency, um, have reached, Denard Scaling is over and Moore's Law is ending. And as that has happened, the first thing that we did was increase the parallelism on chip. Uh, so great. Um, that's kind of observation number one. What's and while the scaling things are um, sort of commonly talked about, you'll see a lot of news articles related to that. What's less talked about is what this shift to parallelism uh, is causing. And in particular, it's really causing, uh, it's causing software and its portability to break. We used to have the long-term durable abstraction that we could compile things for a given assembly language, a given instruction set architecture, and it would run on chip after chip after chip as long as we abided by that same instruction set architecture. We're now in a world where the instruction set architecture is still there, but if we're changing the number of cores and if we're adding different accelerators on chip, the ability to portably uh, program for different chips has gotten much harder, much, much less portable over the years. So uh, let's talk about instruction set architectures. In 1964, basically the same year that Moore's law was being sketched out, which always kind of blows my mind, the term computer architecture, which is the term for the research field that I'm in, was coined. It was coined in an IBM journal in April 1964 in a little footnote. So it's down here at the bottom of the text. And it says the term architecture is used to describe the attributes of a system as seen by the programmer. So it's this notion of a long-term contract where the software just needs to abide by this instruction set architecture. The hardware can do all kinds of craziness under the covers and it will work. And it's given us uh, over 50 years of wonderful portability, verifiability, reliability, because we could rely on that long-term hardware software abstraction. It was great. Um, but this is where we are now. Actually, this is where we were a couple of years ago. This chip uh, photo on the right is now a year or two old. Um, this is what chips look like inside your cell phone, inside your laptop, and so forth. There are some general purpose cores on here, uh, but there's also a number of very specialized cores. Uh, for the radio, for face recognition, for graphics, and so forth. And so we have this, what I would call heterogeneity in the small, meaning even on a single chip, there's not uh, no longer just one instruction set architecture, one assembly language. There's actually dozens of instruction set architectures or assembly languages on this one chip. There's also heterogeneity in the types and uh, availability of memory here and in something called a memory consistency model, which I'll talk about on subsequent slides. In addition to this heterogeneity on each and every chip, there's also heterogeneity in the large, that we have thousands of distinct Android devices, we have even more IoT devices. And so the idea that we can write software once and then compile it easily to, and have it run on many different devices is extraordinarily hard, surprisingly hard, and even harder to get it right, meaning correct and secure. So that's the seismic shift that I'm talking about. The fact that our hardware software abstractions that we have relied on for 50 years, they're still there. They're still useful. There's still an x86 instruction set, obviously, but they have much less relevance as durable long-term abstraction layers. So in the Apple series of processors, a8 was the processor, and that's close to five years ago now. A8 was the processor at which over half the chip area was devoted to accelerators that have no instruction set architecture. So these are basically like big functional units that do one task, face recognition or compression or something. Um, and if you look at uh, GPUs, you'll similarly see cases where uh, companies are sort of actively hiding their instruction set architecture under other layers and asking programmers to program to an API that may or may not be as durable as the instruction set architecture was. And so it's not just that Moore's Law is changing how hardware is, is being built. It's that Moore's Law is having this seismic shift all the way up the stack into um, software and, and systems as well. And so the questions going forward are how are we going to program, how best to program these highly heterogeneous systems, how to manage the complexity that we can no longer abstract away, how to verify them, and what 
what technologies are going to come next? And so uh, one of the sort of wonderful gifts of being a professor is getting to work on uh, different topics. And so I actually work on both classical and quantum computer architectures. And time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about the way forward in quantum at the end of this talk. So back to this chip. Uh, these, these kinds of chips, systems on chips, SOCs, are comprised of many CPUs, GPUs, and accelerators that actually come from many different vendors. So it's not even that one single company is designing this whole chip. They're grabbing uh, parts as IP cores, essentially off the shelf from different vendors, and they're wiring them together on chip. Uh, so it's very hard in this kind of a world to formally specify what any block is supposed to do to create those kinds of durable abstractions. And, there, and it's also quite hard, therefore, to verify that a given block does what it's supposed to do. And so the, one of the sort of ideas I want to put forward for, you, uh, for us to think about is that actually instruction set architectures for many years were a form of specification. Uh, that if you follow the assembly language uh, specification guide for a given instruction set architecture, it formed a, an interface layer that let you do certain things, that let software operate oblivious to what hardware was doing under the covers. So these kinds of formal interface specifications could be the next type of instruction set architecture uh, that we could explore. And I want to put forward some ideas about what it means to be a formal interface specification and what it buys you. Uh, so over the past uh, seven years or so, uh, one of the things that my research group has worked on is something called the, the check tool suite. And the idea of this tool suite is to be a full ecosystem of tools for very early stage verification and synthesis. And so the idea is to really explore this notion of um, interface specifications that are written formally and what that can buy you. And so what I've shown here is kind of the classic stack um, with uh, hardware design or RTL, Verilog down at the bottom, and then the microarchitecture. The architecture is that instruction set architecture interface that I talked about a few slides ago. Compiler OS, high level languages. So this is kind of how, how we like to think about the world pre seismic shift. And this work in the check suite started with one very simple goal. The very simple goal of uh, this first paper that we wrote in 2014 was to say, let's check formally, automatically, that a given microarchitecture is officially upholding the memory access ordering rules specified by the instruction set architecture. So if the instruction set architecture says that loads and stores should happen in a certain order, let's check that a given pipeline, a given implementation of that instruction set or architecture is actually doing it. Uh, and you would say, well, that's got to be something that's been done for years, right? It's actually a very challenging and thorny issue. And um, as I'll show through some examples, uh, folks still get it wrong. And so automatically verifying it is still very useful. From that starting point, we built this whole layered ecosystem of tools that go all the way down to Verilog and that go all the way up to high level languages. And the goal across this ecosystem of tools is to be able to check these, these concurrent memory accesses are happening correctly all the way from C code or, or high level languages down to Verilog and to do so efficiently so that we can do these verifications much earlier in the design. If you wait and verify a design just before you fabricate it in silicon, you've invested an awful lot of time and person hours in that design. And any bug that you find so late in the process will be very expensive just to discover it, much less to fix it. Uh, if you can do more early stage verification, you can catch bugs earlier and avoid some of those costs. So that was our first goal. Um, and the, the secret sauce, the goal, the, the, the approach that we used across all these tools up and down on the right here um, is to say that uh, if we want to verify that memory events, the loads and stores in the program are happening in a correct order, uh, uh, then we can do that through a set of what are called axioms that assert different things we know to be true 
about how the chip is built. And we can turn those axiomatic specifications into what's called a happens before graph. And a happens before graph is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. If I have a rule about a design that says that A will always happen before B, then I can draw a happens before graph in which A and B have an error between them because there's a rule that told me that will always be true in the design. And if I have another specification, another rule that says that B will always happen before C, I can draw this arrow as well. And if someplace else in the design, I have a rule that says that C happens before A, I can draw that arrow as well. Now the key is that once you have the ability to uh, take these specifications and turn them into graphs, you can solve these graphs and you can check for cycles. And the key observation, as you can imagine from seeing this picture is, if A is specified to happen before B, and B is specified to happen before C, and C is specified to happen before A, then A would have to happen before itself. So anytime you find a cycle in these happens before graphs, you've essentially found, you've proven that that case cannot occur. It physically cannot occur because a cycle in a happens before graph would require A to happen before itself. Anytime you find a happens before graph that is acyclic, that says that that particular sequence of events is observable. There could be a time where you run the program and you see that sequence of events. So if we have the ability to specify enough about the system and then enumerate all possible cases, and I'll talk more about this in a few seconds, then we can prove which cases are observable or not. And the key will be if there's a case that is observable and yet the rules, the specification, the design goals say it should never be observable, then we've created a tool that automatically finds bugs for us. And we can bring those examples out to designers and say, hey, you didn't want this to ever happen, but our uh, cycle analysis is showing that it could happen. And, and then we can come up with design changes that will prevent it. Uh, so that's the sort of high level quick tour. I'll give a few more details on the slides that follow. But I also wanted to talk about some other work, uh, slightly more recent, that takes us in unique directions. Uh, so first of all, everything on the right hand side uh, we did in the context of specific programs. So it would check for all possible orderings of the program, but it was for one program. Uh, with the work here called PyProof, we actually extended in some cases to be able to prove uh, correctness of systems across all possible programs. Uh, the other thing that I'll sort of segue into in a few slides is taking all of this work, which seems to be about correctness of a design, and showing how it can be used for security of a design as well. And in particular, uh, we'll talk about cases where being able to uh, detect uh, undesirable event orderings uh, lets you uh, deduce when things like Spectre or Meltdown, the two uh, widely publicized vulnerabilities from a couple of years ago, might be uh, exploitable in your design and um, be able to take action against them. So a little bit of backstory here. I've been talking a lot about event ordering. So let me talk about what this comes from. Um, so uh, essentially all chips today uh, have multiple instructions in flight at once. And so all chips today are basically small concurrent systems. And uh, 40 years ago, Leslie Lamport uh, started working on notions of essentially writing down rules for what execution orders would be allowed in concurrent systems. And in particular, Lamport articulated the notion of something called sequential consistency, which is a set of rules for how memory operations can appear in a concurrent program. And so if you have this tiny, tiny program that's over here on the left, two threads running concurrently, the black thread and the orange thread, uh, then Lamport said, there would be these six different legal executions of those threads because to be sequentially consistent, you have to follow these rules. The memory operation of each processor, each thread need to appear in program order. So the R1 equals Y uh, instruction always has to come after the X equals one instruction. And you'll see that's true in all six of these. Uh, the other rule is that the memory operations of all processors 
have to look as if they were executed in some global sequential order that everyone agrees on. So if one observer sees the execution as having followed this first uh, possibility here on the left, all the observers see it the same way. Okay, so uh, program order and a globally agreed upon order. That was Lamport sequential consistency, 1979. Uh, it was great, uh, but here's the thing. No current processor uses sequential consistency because it precludes too many optimizations that we've come to rely on for good performance in our hardware. So what do we do instead? Well, one thing that we do instead is here's, here is a more recent and more widely used memory consistency model uh, called total store order or TSO. And in particular, this is the memory consistency model in all Intel processors, which represent a sort of huge uh, fraction of the server processors in the world, for example. So here the rules, first of all, the rules take up a lot more space. Lamport's rules were pretty short, pretty clear, and I could show all the interleavings. Here the rules uh, take a whole page instead of just two lines. And the rules uh, are harder to sort of turn into a visualization of all the possible orderings because there are many more. Uh, but you can see reads are not reordered with other reads. Writes are not reordered with older reads, but they can be reordered with other reads. Uh, reads may be reordered with older writes to different locations, but not with older writes to the same location. It's always sort of, I think, um, eye-opening, especially to young folks to realize that here we are in 2021 and we still are not super crisply clear on what are the rules for loads and stores and programs. Um, in a nutshell, these memory consistency models are the specification of what value will be returned when your program does a load. It's, so it's hard to imagine anything more fundamentally important than that. Um, and yet they're really hard to get right. There continue to be bugs in systems because these are hard to test and hard to verify. So, um, so that's why we set out to build those check tools was to get at it. So let's talk a little bit about these happens before graphs um, because I showed a super simple one with A, B, and C on that first slide, but I wanna get into more detail. Let's imagine that we have a processor um, whose block diagram is this sort of cartoon here in the lower left. So it does a fetch of an instruction, then it decodes that instruction, it executes that instruction, it goes to memory if it needs to, and then it writes back any results to the register file. Um, this is a pretty basic um, pipeline. Uh, that's what we often learn about, say, junior year computer architecture class. Uh, one thing I'll show from the memory hierarchy is what's called a store buffer. Uh, this is a spot where if the program is doing a write to a memory address, that write, the written data will first go into a store buffer. And then later at the processor's convenience, perhaps much later, that store will actually get pushed out to memory. And that's pretty key because that's what affects the memory order is um, when that store actually goes out to memory and whether any intervening loads can pass it uh, in line. And so that's what actually makes memory consistency models complicated are these kinds of places where we try to let loads and stores bypass each other in order to gain some performance. And so what I've shown here on the right is a, a happens before graph again, kind of like the first one, except in this case, I'm showing more hardware details. So I'll, instead of A, B, and C, as was on the previous slide, I have fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, store buffer, and memory hierarchy corresponding to different points in hardware. And so what we can do is we can think about how a program like these stores and loads here, this small tiny program is called the litmus test, what sorts of happens before graphs uh, we might see when this program executes on this hardware. So that's the gist of it. We can actually um, write formal specifications for different hardware with those kinds of ideas in mind. Uh, so for example, here's some of the specification for that hardware um, written in a particular specification language that we developed ourselves. And so for example, all that this specification says is that uh, 
there will be a happens before edge between instruction I1 spec and instruction I2 spec, meaning in English, instructions get fetched in order. Uh, we're gonna fetch instructions one at a time and we'll always do that part in order. Um, you can also see down here that this is a relatively simple processor that executes in order also. And so there's some more specification language about execution being in order. And the key idea is that from these specifications, we have tools, we have software that automatically generates all the happens before graphs that are possible uh, for the given specified hardware, and then can automatically check whether there are cycles or no cycles in the graph and compare those cycles or no cycles to what is co considered correct for that hardware. And if we find any cases where something is acyclic, uh, meaning it could happen, and yet the specification says it should never happen, those are the things that we bring to the designer and we say, we think you have a bug. Uh, but it gets even more complicated. Um, because we can actually not just do simple pipelines, we can do fairly complicated pipelines where we are um, going through virtual memory, we are going through translation look aside buffers, and so on and so forth. And I certainly don't expect you to sort of follow or understand the happens before graph that's here, but I will simply say that this is a happens before graph here. It encompasses a whole bunch of different uh, page invalidations, virtual memory operations, operating system effects. And the high order bit here is um, we can analyze these things for cycles automatically so that neither the operating system designer nor the application programmer nor the hardware designer would ever need to analyze these things by hand because we can automate it and find the cycle. You can see that there is a bold faced set of edges here that correspond to um, a cycle in this graph saying this scenario could not happen because it's cyclic. Uh, so let's make this a little more real um, because it's been fairly abstract so far. In 2017, we took these tools, uh, a bunch of tools embodying these techniques, that stack of tools that I mentioned, and we set out to, to study the RISC-V instruction set. And so I don't know if uh, any of you are hobbyists who have worked on RISC-V in different uh, scenario, in different kind of settings, but RISC-V is a relatively recently introduced instruction set. It's about five years old, and it's designed to be an open source instruction set so that if you want to design processors yourself and you don't want to have to license the ARM instruction set um, and so on and so forth, you can use the RISC-V instruction set. It has a huge open source community around it. Uh, a lot of RISC-V processors are now getting generated. Um, and at the time, four years ago in 2017, there was a specification for the full instruction set, but it was in draft form. So we took the specification and, and in particular, we took its description of uh, memory event ordering, these memory consistency models, and we wrote out our axiomatic spec for different types of RISC-V processors. And we set out to do some of the automatic cycle analysis that I've shown you, or I've sketched out for you here. Um, what we learned is that there were bugs in the specification. There were ambiguities in the specification and there were problems in the specification such that there were ways, there were completely legal C programs that could not be correctly compiled to, risk, to certain RISC-V processors. Um, and so the story has a happy ending uh, we you know, sort of brought those issues to the attention of the RISC-V um, Foundation and the open source community. They formed a memory model working group to come up with a new specification. The new specification uh, was ratified in 2018. And so now RISC-V has one of the most beautiful formally specified memory models you'll ever want to find um, and well verified too, because it went through this vetting process. And we're pretty we see this as a win-win situation. We're pretty proud of the way our tools were able to identify problems early in RISC-V's lifetime. And so now as it goes out and it gets really quite huge use, um, it has a really nice memory model and it will be able to sort of withstand an awful lot of um, different usage scenarios. Okay, so that's correctness. Uh, let's go to security. 
You might not think that where I've started with this talk seems to lead to security, but, but think about it. What we would like in general for security is we'd like to be able to specify a system, um, specify an attack pattern, and then have a set of tools tell us whether it's possible for that attack pattern to be used on that system. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be an awful lot nicer of a tool flow or workflow than what we currently do with security, which is to kind of stare at designs, see if we can find the vulnerabilities before the bad guys do, right? So this is what we would like. Um, this is what we did. Uh, we took a tool that was based on the, these uh, microarchitectural happens before graphs that I already talked about in previous parts of the talk. And we developed a way in which we could automatically synthesize pieces of code uh, that represented uh, specific attack patterns. The results were that we actually uh, automatically synthesized Spectre and Meltdown, the two widely publicized vulnerabilities of a couple of years ago. And we also found new exploits that our tool automatically synthesized as part of its process. Um, that were distinct from Spectre Meltdown, but of the same family. Uh, so how did we do this? And what does it have to do with the happens before graphs that I've shown before? The key idea here, the reason why it works is that uh, the security vulnerabilities of Spectre and Meltdown, uh, if you stop and think about it, they, they basically uh, rest on being able to orchestrate certain read-write patterns in memory in a particular order. And guess what? Read-write patterns in a particular order in memory is exactly what our previous tools that I talked about, these, these consistency model tools, were designed to do. So what we did is we took a microarchitecture specified using the same axioms as before. And we had a new way of specifying patterns, exploit patterns. Uh, and so while this may not look like much, this thing in red, um, this is essentially an exploit pattern, uh, very similar to uh, what gets used in Spectre. Uh, and then we can give execution constraints to make the problem a little bit easier for the automatic synthesis tool to manage number of cores, number of threads, number of instructions. And essentially what this tool called Checkmate does is it synthesizes all the possible graphs, all that happens before graphs, uh, in which this pattern is present as a fragment um, on this specified microarchitecture. And then each one of these happens before graphs that gets synthesized represents a different uh, snippet of code uh, that could be turned into a, uh, into a piece of malware, into a security exploit. So um, I don't have time to go too far into detail on any of these, uh, but here's kind of the overall scorecard. In terms of correctness results, um, I mentioned the risk 5 results already, that we found these issues with how the whole instruction set was specified. Um, and the whole and the instruction set specification was reworked because of our research. That's pretty cool. In addition to that, um, we found bugs in an IBM compiler. Uh, we, it's been used to find bugs in an InDesign uh, industry processor. We found uh, flaws in two quote unquote proofs um, in uh, some compiler papers that our work was trying to draw from. And we realized uh, we had to fix the proofs and fix the work before we could use it. Um, and aspects of the C11 memory model are also being sort of reconsidered in light of some of our results as well. Um, on the security side, as I said, we created this tool that lets us automatically synthesize exploit codes for these kind for a particular set of vulnerabilities, namely these vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown that have to do with um, event orderings at the hardware software interface. And we synthesized Spectre and Meltdown automatically, and then we found some other new variants of them as well. Um, but if you step back from all of that and sort of think about what the overall philosophy was, one piece of the philosophy was a, a desire to move from 
ad hoc analysis of staring at a design to see if it looked correct to more formal automated and where possible exhaustive techniques. Second thing was to say, let's move these, these analyses as early in the design process as possible. Because if you find a bug just before something's in silicon, or frankly, if you find a bug after it's in silicon, that's super expensive. If you can find the bug early in the design process, you can rework pretty easily. Um, and efficient analysis, all of these tools rest on um, elaborate satisfiability solvers. And yet the goal was to frame the problems in ways that would allow for one hour or less of runtime on all the tools. The other thing is about that stack, that these span software, OS, and hardware to, to give really holistic system results. So um, first of all, what does that have to do with the, the Utah picture, the seismic shift? Um, well, all of that has to do with putting forward this belief that we should be building systems based on formal specifications rather than based on programming languages per se, because where we can build things based on formal specifications, we can automate different things. We can automate compilation, we can automate program synthesis, we can automate verification. Um, so that'll take us a certain way down the road, but at some point you have to think about what technologies come next. And uh, there's a lot of different um, speculation on this front, uh, by no means am I going to say that uh, quantum is the only answer or that it's the answer, um, but it's an interesting thing that some of us have been studying and it represents one possible way forward. And so this is my attempt to try to um, fit in a couple slides about quantum and also show hopefully by the end that quantum is facing a lot of the same hardware software challenges that these classical challenges from the first half of my talk represent. Okay, so just some brief overview. Where are we in quantum? Uh, here's a timeline, 1995 to the present. And on the y-axis now is qubits instead of transistors. Uh, but it's still log scale. Uh, and so what this tries to show in this graph is, first of all, um, the, the blue are algorithms. So Shor's factoring algorithm is uh, sort of widely known. Uh, because it was one of the earliest quantum algorithms to be uh, sort of explored in detail. And because it seems to offer the potential for exponential speed up if the right quantum system existed. And because of Shor's factoring algorithm and because of its implications for crypto, um, I think a lot of uh, momentum in the quantum research community has been carried forward because of Shor's. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, Shor's factoring algorithm and also Grover's algorithm, another early algorithm, have huge resource requirements, thousands or hundreds of thousands of qubits. And what we can build right now is just a few dozen. Uh, so there's this huge gap, the algorithms to machine gap that we see. Um, there's some good news because there are newer quantum algorithms that are starting to have smaller resource requirements, so the gap is closing a little bit there. There's good news in, in that this yellow line, which represents our ability to build hardware, um, is scaling upwards. We're building bigger systems. And we seem to be getting better at building bigger systems. So maybe that yellow line will tilt upwards. Uh, it remains to be seen. But there's still a gap. And so uh, John Preskill referred to the era we're in now as the noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC era. And sort of this 10 to 1,000 qubits um, too small for anything like shores, too small for error correcting codes that would sort of help with some of the reliability issues of these systems, but large enough to be interesting. So what's a, what's a classical architect doing in a place like this? Um, well, it turns out that there's an awful lot of work that can happen here in this green zone to basically shrink the gap between algorithms and hardware. And it can be done using compilers, using classical architecture techniques. And so that's where um, my research has focused. And that's where the research of many of the folks that I collaborate with have focused. I'm going to give you just one quick example of something that we did. We put on our just sort of normal classical architect hats, but we went over into the quantum space. And we started to ask questions about these machines. Uh, what are some of the questions we asked? Uh, we asked basically, what's the instruction set of your quantum machine, which is to say, what gates 
can it operate on? Uh, what's the connectivity or how do the qubits um, interact with each other? Uh, and we did this across a fairly in-depth exploration of seven different real prototypes from three different vendors. Uh, to do this fairly, we had to create our own compiler so that we could take the same quantum benchmarks and map them onto seven different quantum systems um, and do fair comparisons. And then we did exactly the kinds of things that architects would do in the classical world. We said, what gates um, are useful or less useful? Um, how often uh, does one machine actually execute a program well? And in the classical world, we usually worry about how fast things run. In the quantum world, we're trying to just see, you know, how often do they actually run correctly? So we did this kind of architect's comparative study. And I can't go into detail. Um, actually, Prakash Morley would be a great person to invite for another of these talks, because he could go into detail. Um, and he's a graduating PhD student coming out of my group very soon. Um, but here's uh, sort of one overview slide of what we did, and then I'll give one results slide. Uh, so we took these programs, teeny tiny quantum programs, nowhere near shores, um, just a handful of qubits and a handful of gates. Um, but we, they're written out like programs, and so you could treat them like uh, programs, you could treat them like benchmarks. You can run them through a compiler, and you can map them onto different quantum systems. And in particular, there's, there's more quantum systems out there for people to use um, uh, than you might be aware of or than you, um, you might realize are sort of publicly available. So there's several uh, cloud-connected IBM systems that many people can have access to. And then in addition, there are other companies like Rigetti uh, who have also at times made their systems publicly available. Uh, and then uh, we also had access to a University of Maryland system. These funny uh, pictures here on the right, the qubit topology, in quantum systems, you don't have a notion of sort of general purpose instructions quite the same way. It's closer to a field programmable gate array, if you're familiar with those on the classical side. Um, but the basic idea is that these pictures show, this is a five qubit system and the blue arrows show which qubits can do gate operations with each other. So which qubits can interact with each other directly um, versus having to do indirect gate operations. So our compiler was designed to optimize aggressively for a number of different things. Optimize aggr aggressively for mapping onto these different um, implementations in a way that would make the best use of the limited topology. Also mapping onto these in a way that would make the best use of um, any calibration data that we might have um, about which qubits uh, were creating the most accurate and successful gates at any particular time. So long story short, um, here's the money shot. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, believe it or not, although these are tiny benchmarks, this is one of the more comprehensive quantum benchmark comparisons that exists on Earth right now. Uh, so what we did is we took these seven different systems. You can see them as different colors of bar charts, but these are the same seven systems that you saw in these pictures over here. Uh, and we took the benchmarks that you saw in that table on the left-hand side of the previous slide. That's what's across the bottom here. And what's the y-axis? The y-axis here is not performance, because in a classical world, we might care a lot about how fast things are. In the quantum world, we care about whether they get the right answer or not. Um, because of the noisiness of current quantum systems, um, their execution is often dominated by error rates. And so uh, a figure of merit for current quantum systems is the measured success rate, or if I run this program 8,000 times, what percentage of those 8,000 runs get the correct answer? And so what you can see, first of all, is there's a pretty big variation. Um, uh, so some programs uh, uniformly have higher success rates than other programs. Uh, you also see that there's some variation between different implementations. Uh, so for example, the University of Maryland trapped ion or TI machine that you see here uh, has very good success rates, 
but there's a lot of programs it can't run because it's too small. Uh, other uh, machines um, like the IBM Q5 and the IBM Q14 don't have quite as high success rates on average, um, but can run many more programs. And so there's interesting trade-offs there. Uh, and there's an awful lot more to study as we go forward with this. But where I wanted to get us to by the end was to make this analogy and bring this all back to the notion of the, the layers, the Utah layers on that first slide. Um, so the analogy is this. If you think about 1950s classical computing, uh, we had algorithms up high, uh, we had assembly language, we had vacuum tubes or rel relay circuits way down low. Um, and quantum is in, and, and actually this is a very, um, it's fun to be giving this talk this week because um, many of you are aware that this, this was uh, ENIAC's 75th birthday week. The ENIAC press release went out on Valentine's Day um, 75 years ago. And there were some celebrations down in Philadelphia of ENIAC. Uh, so 1950s is uh, slightly after ENIAC, but same idea. Vacuum tubes, relay circuits, algorithms up high, and not much in the middle. And that's where quantum is right now. Um, and so it took us decades to get to the layered approach that, uh, that we think about and that we teach curriculums about uh, today, namely algorithms and implementations at the bottom and all these nice layers in between. In addition to sort of noting the way it took us a while to get to these abstraction layers, it's also important to note that if you were gonna bet on technologies in 1950, we knew how to build a transistor in 1950, but we weren't building computers out of those transistors. We were building computers out of other technologies. And so if you wanted to bet on a technology in 1950, it probably wouldn't have been the transistor. Um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind for quantum as well. It's too soon to bet on a quantum implementation technology. Uh, the other thing that's noteworthy about this analogy is we have a pretty good idea of the to-do list that we need for the layers that go between algorithms and qubits in um, modern quantum systems. I showed that to-do list as part of the, the compiler that we developed that I talked about on the previous slide. What we don't yet have an idea for is whether we will be able to create these kinds of abstraction layers for quantum systems or whether we simply will not be at a point of abstraction for quite some time because of error rates because of resource constraints. Uh, but here's the thing that I wanna leave you with. Um, this classical layering itself is a bit um, wishful thinking because of the seismic shift that's gone on. In particular, even on the classical side, uh, we're seeing these, what I would call post ISA tool flows where algorithms go to high level languages and then drill down through the old abstraction layers to get straight to implementations. A great example of this is the TensorFlow programming model, drilling down straight to TPUs on Google hardware. Um, quantum tool flows are similar right now. So a lot of the quantum tool flows drill through all the abstraction layers. And so what we see overall is this real strong potential for um, new technologies like quantum, which will be super fun to explore, but also a real strong potential for the seismic shift in how computers are designed overall, to change to more formal interfaces and to accept the fact that um, we may lose some of these layering abstractions um, and have to replace them with sort of automated synthesis and verification techniques in their place. And so with that, my whirlwind tour ends and um, here's a few links and I would be Happy to take a couple questions if there's time. So I don't know how to do this. I can. Uh, there's one question here in the chat. Is the microarchitecture helping shortages in the hardware design? now limited by a higher density of different functions uh, such as face recognition added to the chip. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's definitely true that the fact that we have so many different accelerators on the chip, face recognition, compression, um, baseband processing for the radio, yada, 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 that's making it much harder to um, 
program these systems. Um, and it also means that the microarchitecture has to deal with a whole bunch of not just different functional units, but also um, different protocols of how to push data to different types of accelerators across the chip. Some accelerators uh, being um, tightly coupled to the processor and some accelerators being more loosely coupled, uh, kind of like satellites elsewhere on the chip. Uh, so let's see, is it possible to derive the axiomatic model to happens before graph from the hardware as built uh, without having access to a formal description of the microarchitecture? That's, that's a great question. I, and I like that question because we have something of an answer to it. Um, namely, uh, one of my students has done work where uh, actually two of my students have done different aspects of work where they derive aspects of the specifications um, automatically from the Verilog with a little, well, a little help from the designer, but from the Verilog um, without having, um, without having required a formal specification to precede the design. So you can get some stuff out of the design, um, but that's a really harder direction. It's much easier if you have the axioms first and you automatically synthesize the design than it is to have a design that was sort of handwritten and then pull the formality out of that. And the best analogy that I can make is think about if someone handed you assembly code and asked you to figure out what was going on and then write uh, code in a high level language to match it. That sort of back calculation of what's going on from assembly and then turning it into a high level language is a whole lot harder than having a high level language and compiling down to assembly. Margaret, I think we, we have a couple of people who raised hands here on ah. the on the Zoom call, and we might want to recognize them for questions. So well, uh, one of them is uh, uh, Sharon Kalwani, and then and we'll go to Emilio next. Okay, um, yeah. So I actually have two parts. Let me get the first part out of the way. Um, you mentioned some resources on the last slide about quantum, and uh, you drew the analogy you know, from the 50s to where we were and then how it advanced. But as far as I know, current quantum technology is very, very finicky. Uh, it has to be uh, RF isolated. It has to be at a super cold temperature and it has to be built in stages and um, they have to be mated with a, a regular classical uh, machine and at that interface, um, they're kind of limited to maybe search problems and using simulated annealing. Now, there have been some attempts at, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, building quantum hardware that doesn't require such super cool temperatures, mm -hmm. but it does seem to be still a very difficult problem despite all the money being thrown at it. So could you comment on that? And why do we expect that we'll have the same kind of leap as we had with semiconductors? Um, so yeah, my slide on the algorithms to machine gap, I, I could give a whole hour long talk and I often do on you know how hard it has been to build larger scale quantum machines. We're currently at around uh, 50 to 70 qubits. Uh, but a couple things. So first of all, keep in mind, 50 high quality qubits would have a state space of two to the 50th, which is huge, right? And 70 high quality qubits would have a state space beyond the capabilities of largest supercomputers on earth. So although the qubit counts seem small, if those were truly high quality qubits, uh, the, the computational capabilities of those machines would be massive. Um, they are prone to noise. Um, the very things that make qubits interesting as, uh, as uh, computational operators are the way they interact with their environment. Um, but if something interacts a lot with the environment, it's, it's also noise prone. And so getting that balance right is challenging. 
Um, a couple things. Uh, so I will note that in the classical world, uh, we had about a decade between when we invented the transistor and when it started being used to build, you know, fairly decent sized transistorized computers like TX0, TX1, TX2. Um, in that decade, we had the uh, advantage of the fact that we could be fabricating transistors um, for use in other purposes, like radios, right? So we had transistor radios. Companies could make money off of, off of fabricating transistors well for radios and learn more about how to fab them well, and then eventually turn them into logic devices and computers. We don't so what we need out of quantum right now is the same kind of virtuous cycle where there are several uses for the qubits um, as good communications repeaters, as good sensors and so forth, uh, so that we can build up the capabilities towards being able to compute with them as well. Having said all of that, the advances in quantum volume, that is reliable quantum computation at scale, uh, have been really impressive over the past five years and very promising. And so uh, there are expectations that quantum will be um, useful and advantageous for a narrow set of computations um, within five to 10 years. It won't replace general purpose computing uh, anytime soon, maybe never, um, but advantageous for certain computations within 10 years is something that I think many people are um, more willing to get behind these days. Thanks. Um, I think I think Emilio had a, a, a question or two he wanted yeah, to ask. Um, he's still there. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, so Margaret uh, pretty much answered uh, the question I had. Basically, in my experience, uh, when going uh, into deeper and deeper CISC levels uh, of uh, systems and trying to uh, speed up the machine by uh, doing uh, functions like square roots in the in the hardware uh, we, we we gain a lot of performance however uh, the results were more accurate from the hardware than it they, they were from from the software because the limitation of number of iterations and the Newton wraps and algorithms so basically, so we had to go and sometimes take a step back into that. And now it goes, and my, and my question was more like, all right, for the quantum uh, area, I, I think I agree with you. It's still gonna be taking quite a bit for us to be able to get there and get reproducible results. Um, so that I, I just, uh, and thank you for answering most, uh, a lot of my question was uh, what you already talked about. Thank you. There's actually a, a very analogous uh, CISC example in quantum to, to what you were asking, what you were mentioning for um, your accelerators that you mentioned, your functional units that you mentioned in classical, um, where uh, building uh, more complex gate operations in quantum actually leads to calibration and noise issues. Um, and so that there's that same kind of trade-off between having beefy CISC gates that do a lot versus the noise issues they may be prone to. Thank you so much. Uh, Margaret, it looks like there's a couple of questions on the chat from Wei about optical uh, technology. I don't know <laughs> if you can see those. <laughs> uh, if I said about quantum, we might as well talk about optical. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I, I don't think I'm gonna bet on um, time frames. I think I've made enough time frame bets for this particular talk. I'm but, curious what Wei thinks. Uh, okay, hi, <laughs> uh, Margaret, very nice talk. Uh, because I'm asking this question because I'm first I'm working on uh, photonic chips. And uh, so uh, I'm quite interested in, in, in getting your view on this because you are at NSF, you probably see a lot of uh, this kind of uh, ideas. And uh, so you might have a better perspective than I do. But anyway, 
the, the background is uh, you probably saw there are a couple of uh, papers that from uh, uh, I think MIT and Berkeley they announced that they, they, on in nature they uh, developed some uh, chip scale uh, actually interchip optical interconnects and uh, and uh, I think there might be some chips companies supporting they are doing uh, commercialization work on those so so. Do you think uh, their work will lead to like uh, some adoption of uh, optical interconnect in the next uh, ten years? Basically, you know the the yeah the, the, the traditional computer chip is uh, one bottleneck is in interconnect and optical interconnect uh, has uh, potentially less uh, power consumption and uh, uh, no like much better bandwidth. Yeah, I think the, the challenge has always been the, uh, the transition from optical to electrical back and forth. And so um, I think there could be some kinds of wafer scale situations where you'd use the optical for the long haul, if you will, and then switch mm -hmm. to electrical for local. But it's, it's not my area. So um, if you're bullish on it, uh, that sounds good to me. Okay, thanks. So, okay. Okay, that, 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 that'd be good. Thank you. Oh, I think uh, Andre has a question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dennis. Um, I was struck by your remark at the beginning of the talk about how portability is being undermined. Uh, and coming from a, an, oper an operating system background, my immediate thought was, how do you manage inter-process communication? And what mechanisms do you have for locking when you have all these heterogeneous processors that are talking to each other and doing very different things? What kind of convention do you have to express this? And how do you manage it when even in uh, the conventional environments that we have today, uh, you get different results uh, when you have single and multiple multi-core systems because uh, you, you don't have thread safety because concurrent programming is just so darn hard. People don't like to do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it was about five to seven years ago, it was maybe seven or eight. It was just at the very beginning of us doing this set of check tools. And I was um, visiting and giving a seminar at a major chip vendor. And, and I... I said, you know, you, you build hardware. How do you figure out um, that your implementation of things is correctly dovetailing with the operating operating systems implementation of things? And the answer was that they got some people from the operating system side in a room with some of the hardware people, and they talked it out. And that actually, the the complete and utter craziness of that scenario is what motivated a lot of this work um, to try to automate the analysis across those layers. So how do people, you, you know, how, do, how does it get done now? In a lot of cases, um, there are APIs that are locking um, fairly conservatively, like uh, lock, transfer data, or lock, pin data, um, to avoid uh, too fine-grained interactions that are hard to reason about. So in essence, they're creating coarse-grained uh, synchronization blocks because anything finer-grained would be too hard to ensure any level of correctness on. That means that we're giving up a lot of performance in exchange for having, you know, we're giving up performance because we can't analyze the systems very well. It also and means that you're tolerating loose consistency as opposed to strict consistency. No, it's the opposite. They're, they're oh. actually being overly conservative. They're locking oh, more than they need to, and they're pinning, pinning pages down rather than have them go in and out simply because um, opening themselves up to additional concurrency or additional interleaving makes things too hard to analyze. There's a huge performance penalty associated with that. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Uh, there's a great question here by R.B. Thomas on the chat. Spectre should have been a wake-up call. 
the fact that you were able to automatically discover that problem is very encouraging. Are the processor manufacturers currently taking advantage of this capability? I love that question. Uh, so uh, Spectre was a make was a was a wake up call. So the the order of events was that we had the checkmate tool um, working, uh, but there were a a couple uh, modeling approaches that we hadn't yet finished when Spectre and Meltdown hit the news. And so within a week of Spectre and Meltdown hitting the news we adjusted our modeling approaches and synthesized them um, and synthesized the newer exploits as well. Uh, so we were not the discoverers of Spectre and Meltdown, but we did automatically synthesize it a little bit later. It was very much of a wake up call to, um, I think to the community overall about the degree to which um, confusion at the hardware software interface could be really uh, tragic, costly, um, serious issues. What I haven't seen is the wholesale, and, and I think there's a greater appreciation as a result for formal techniques that help automatically explore spaces. But I haven't seen a wholesale shift to those techniques yet. Um, there's still an awful lot of uh, designers looking at designs and reasoning about them, where I think it should be more automated and more um, early stage verification of the type that we've been trying to advocate for. Um, we do, you know, obviously when we synthesize those those um, uh, variants, we gave those to the companies that we thought they were relevant for, and the companies did. Um, appreciate that we were passing that along and they have taken on some of the ideas of what we do. Uh, it just more could get done in terms of automatic exploration of either correctness issues or security issues. I think we'll take the one last question here and you can see it in the chat there from Neil. What happens when the particular abstraction layer on which the graph method relies as the starting point for the analysis is optimized away by new design methodologies? Oh, well, that's a fun question. So um, by the end of the check suite, we were pretty high up. We were at, at the programming language layer. And so there was not much above us, you know, the, the likelihood of that getting optimized away was very low. Just create a different um, programming language layer uh, if you switch uh, programming languages. There are interesting challenges um, when optimizations get applied between specifications of memory consistency models. So for example, I mentioned a, uh, that we found a set of compiler bugs in a commercial compiler. We found them not in the base compiler, we found them in the O4 optimizations, right? So the most aggressive optimizations were doing things, and in particular, were composing together different optimizations in ways that were creating bugs. Um, and, and so that isn't so much having a layer get optimized away, but it does say that when you're between specified points, um, that's slightly more challenging. And that's where we found the bugs in the IBM compiler. Um, but I think my answer to Neil's question in particular would simply be uh, write a new specification. Great. I think and I with that, uh, I just want to say thanks um, for everyone's time and attention. I wasn't sure who would be here at the end of our whirlwind tour. And I'm thrilled that there's still a number of people out there in Zoom land. So, so thank you very much. Okay. I, I'm gonna keep the, uh, the meeting open for a while so people can continue to chat. But um, I, think, uh, I think we're actually done for today and we'll see everybody four weeks from today uh, for our next meeting or at one of the other events that are going on in the, uh, in the New Jersey area in, uh, in the, the month of March, so. And we'll go off and sweep all, all the snow off of our cars now. Too. <laughs>